from University of Santiago de Compostela. Okay, so I'm <laughs> thank you. So I'm going to deliver this talk uh, on behalf of Professor Alonso, who unfortunately couldn't come because of a medical situation that got complicated and so he had to cancel last moment. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, polymer nanoparticles for oral peptide delivery and uh, more specifically uh, about the transient project we are coordinating. So um, protein and peptide therapeutics have a great impact in, in the treatment of important systemic diseases, but as you know, uh, these uh, mm, therapeutics cannot be administered in the most desirable way, which would be the oral administration. Uh, this is illustrated by these numbers, the huge number of, of new biopharmaceuticals approved and under clinical development, and a large proportion of them belongs to this um, type of, uh, of macromolecules, the peptides and proteins. Despite of this, there are only two peptides that can be currently administered by the oral route, and these are not very typical peptides. One of them is a small hydrophobic molecule, cyclosporin A, and the other one is a, a very cheap and and very bioactive molecule, desmopressin, that can be administered and, and is very active at a very low dose. So despite this increasing number of, of uh, peptide drugs uh, in the industrial pipeline, uh, the oral administration is uh, still a, a major goal of, uh, of pharmaceutical technology. And as you can imagine, it is uh, on one hand because of the degradation of the peptides and proteins in the in the uh, very aggressive uh, environment of the gastrointestinal tract. But on the other hand, it's also uh, attributed to, to the difficulty of these macromolecules to, to penetrate uh, across uh, biological barriers like the uh, epithelia and the intestinal mucosa. So we think that in order to, to really exploit the potential of these molecules, uh, the way uh, in which we deliver them is, is a key factor. So uh, our group at the University of Santiago de Compostela has been working uh, for almost 20 years on the development of, of nanocarriers specifically adapted to, to transmucosal administration routes and also for, for uh, the development of nanocarriers which can efficiently protect and, and deliver peptide and protein drugs. And so far uh, what we found is that the most promising systems um, among all this uh, portfolio are those core shell uh, lipid and polymer structures based on polysaccharides or polypeptides. And some of these prototypes have already uh, uh, gave, uh, given some interesting in vivo data. For example, here we can see calcitonin loaded kaitosan nanocapsules administered orally to rats. And we can see that in contrast to the control solution, uh, calcitonin solution, uh, the nanocapsules uh, Result, the administration of the nanocapsules results in a, in a very decreased, uh, significantly decreased calcemia level in the blood, which is sustained for at least 24 hours. And the difference is also uh, appreciated between the nanoemulsion, which, is, which does not have a, a biopolymer coating, and the nanocapsule, which is coated with the biopolymer chitosan. Um, similarly, for uh, oral insulin administration, we can see that uh, it, in, in this case, we again talk about chitosan nanoparticles. This time it's, it's loaded with the insulin. Uh, the difference between the insulin solution administered orally and the nano encapsulated insulin is clear. We can see an important reduction in blood uh, glucose levels. And again, this effect is sustained for a long time. So in order, order to better understand the performance and the efficacy of these carriers, we um, studied in detail their um, um, mechanistic uh, behavior and also their toxicity. So what we found regarding uh, the properties of chitosan uh, uh, to enhance uh, epithelial permeability is that um, yeah, we, can, we can achieve uh, reduced values of uh, transepithelial uh, uh, resistance in, in a CACO2 cell line but this is only observed with a, a quite high dose of these particles. So this effect alone would not be uh, sufficient to, to explain the, the performance of the carriers. Similarly, when we check the interaction of the nanocarriers with the epithelia, we can also see like a massive accumulation of nanoparticles are fluorescent and, and are in green. This is again a CACO2 model. And we see a, we see a, a massive uh, accumulation of the particles, but it, if we see the, the cross-section, we can see that they are rather accumulated on, 
on the apical side, so we could not really see the particles crossing massively the, the monolayer. So these results explain in part the, the performance of the carriers, but we don't have a, a, a clear idea how do they work. So based on these findings and also similar reports from other uh, groups from all, of, all over the world, we thought that it's important to, to form a large consortium and uh, dedicate this consortium to, to gain more knowledge, to, to have a better understanding of, of the interaction of the carriers with biological barriers and in particular with intestinal barrier. And uh, this project is uh, uh, entitled the Transint. This is new oral nanomedicines transporting therapeutic macromolecules across the intestinal barrier. And the motto is, just as I said, I, our idea is to understand the barrier and understand the carrier. So this project is coordinated by our group and uh, in particular by Professor Alonso. And I'm involved in this project as the leader of the work package uh, dedicated to the development and optimization of the nanostructures. So um, in order to achieve this goal, we, we formed a, a large uh, European consortium based on 12 academic partners uh, from nanotechnologies groups, uh, others uh, dealing with the, the mechanistic issues of, of the carriers, also toxicology and immunotoxicology, and also chemical biology. We also have uh, SMEs in, in the consortium, these three SMEs, Veneto Nanotech, Seroscience, and Sigmoid Pharma. So these groups are, uh, are uh, dealing with the design, development, and uh, in vivo, in vitro assessment of the uh, formulations. And then, of course, a key partner in, in the consortium is Sanofi, uh, who provides us with the candidates, the drug candidates, and they will also be in charge in a further step of the process um, of the preclinical evaluation of the most promising prototypes. So having two uh, nanotechnologies groups and, and all these partners, um, we, what, we are planning to do is really to, to get a better understanding and then to, to implement this better understanding for the rational design of the nanocarriers. And for that, we need to, to check step by step all the key processes in, in the, in, the uh, in vivo phase of the carrier. So we, we are studying in detail the uh, gastrointestinal uh, biological stability of the carriers, their interaction with the mucus, which is not just the adhesion, but also the diffusion through the mucus. Also the interaction then with the epithelial uh, uh, cell layer, the adhesion, the penetration and the translocation of the carriers. And uh, based on our previous data, I think it's important to clarify that we are not necessarily looking into the situation when the carriers cross the mucus layer and the epithelial barrier. And probably we would be also interested in, in other situations when the carriers just stay in the gut and the peptide is delivered through, through the epithelium. Then, of course, we are uh, studying in detail drug release and drug absorption as well. So the nanocarriers are designed uh, by, by basic principles of using safe biomaterials and easy and, and mild technologies that uh, have the ability to, to, for scaling up. And we are using different lipids, polysaccharides, polypeptides. We also have some bioadhesive and penetration enhancers in the composition. We have different nanostructures like nanoparticles, nanocapsules, and micelles. And um, so far, as, as you can see, this is a decision-making process. We start with a large number of carriers from the different groups. At the, at the beginning, at, in phase A, we have about 60 prototypes. And then we have an extensive in vitro, in vivo, uh, in vitro, sorry, physical chemical characterization, which involves also the micro interaction capacities. And then we have this decision-making process where we are um, continuing only with the most um, promising prototypes uh, along the project. So we are currently more or less in phase B and C that, as you can imagine, they, they have some significant overlap because this is peptide loading and this is the uh, in vitro uh, chemical physical characterization. So we are somewhere here now and we have a number of uh, very promising prototypes which uh, are now uh, going into the in vitro uh, biological evaluation and also in vivo uh, the preliminary in vivo studies. Uh, this is not reflected in, in this uh, uh, image, uh, the work package structure and the activities uh, um, related to, to each work package. One very important and active one is, is the education and another one is, is the dissemination because really our goal is to, to gain and accumulate new knowledge on, on in this field. So what uh, we know so far is that we have a number of promising uh, nanocarrier prototypes. 
which can efficiently protect the peptides from degradation. They can help uh, transporting the peptides across the barriers. We still need to, to accumulate more information on mechanistic issues and on rational design, and, and this formulation strategy is case by case for each system and for each peptide candidate we are using currently. So thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions. Yeah.